tonight, malware that comes pre-installed on PCs, a smarter Barbie, and we guess the price of the Apple Watch. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 278 for Thursday, February 19th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Invest in yourself and start learning today. lynda.com has thousands of courses to help you learn new tech, business, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to today's top story. Chinese computer maker Lenovo admitted today that they had shipped some laptops with a software called Superfish Visual Discovery pre-installed. The software is a browser add-on that claims to be some sort of search technology, but it also serves up ads and tracks your web browsing habits. What's worse is that it leaves you vulnerable to a man-in-the-middle attack. Lenovo began receiving complaints about the adware as far back as June 2014, but didn't stop preloading the software until last month. And as it turns out, the adware is still there on many machines. Security experts were outraged, as well they should be. And even though Lenovo admitted that they didn't do enough due diligence before pre-installing Superfish, the company didn't do a very good job of soothing anyone, even going for so far as to say in an interview with the Wall Street Journal, we're not trying to get into an argument with the security guys. Hey, we're not all guys. The company says that they were releasing a tool that removes all traces of Superfish, even the stuff that was left over after uninstalling it, and they promised that the tool will be released either tonight or tomorrow. We'll have links in our show notes of ways to find out if your laptop is infected and what to do about it. And on a lighter note, toys that play with your kids, great or creepy. We've invited Selena Larson from The Daily Dot to talk about, us, talk about this with us. Welcome, Selena. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So you wrote a story about Cognitoys, an internet-connected dinosaur that's powered by IBM Supercomputer Watson. Mm -hmm. What does the dinosaur do? So essentially, it's a smart dinosaur, so your kids can talk to it, interact with it, and it can talk back. It remembers basically any information that your child tells it, um, its name, it, their age, and it's it's sort of tailored to however old the, the child is. So if it's a, a young child and they have like, you know, younger conversations, and it's supposed to be an educational toy to help kids learn. And as the child grows up and gets older and, and you know, goes through school, the dinosaur is supposed to grow with it and learn and grow with the child. So it remembers previous conversations? Is it actually recording the conversations or is it kind of like the Samsung TV that listens to you? <laughs> no, so it sort of remembers them, right? So it's using the Watson supercomputer. So it's that it's it's using artificial intelligence to basically remember these things and, and sort of store them, you know, store store this data and keep this data. And so in the future, it can cough back up information that you told it, right? So if you told it a funny joke or if you said that I like dancing or I like swimming, then the dinosaur potentially could say, did you dance today? Or tell me that joke that you know. Um, so, it, so it's kind of meant to interact and, and interact with your child and be smart and, and really learn as your child does. So um, does this remind you at all of the movie Her, just a younger version of it? <laughs> you know, it is kind of a little bit creepy. It does sort of bring up some potential questions. But as I wrote in my story, you know, we're, everything's connected and we put all of these appliances in our connected home and it was only really a matter of time before it came to the toy box. And there are still a lot of bugs and kinks to work through. I mean, there are definitely um, security issues. I think we all remember that baby monitor that a hacker kind of got into and started screaming at a sleeping child. Um, so there are, you know, these potential fears that we have. Um, but it was really, you know, just a matter of time before this happened. So it could be a little bit creepy, but as long as you're, you know, paying attention to your kid, making sure what it is that they're playing with, um, it's really just going to be a more involved play toy. Well, you know, it's funny that you say paying attention to your kids because I think a lot of parents um, <laughs> use toys and sometimes iPads and iPhones uh, to, so they don't have to pay attention to their kids. <laughs> So I, I wonder about that. I mean, you say the toy's personality changes as the child interacts with it, but I'm more concerned with how the child's personality changes as they interact with the toy. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's really, like it, like I said, it's built to sort of be, just be the sort of artificial intelligence thing, and it doesn't have like a personality, right? It's just a computer. So it's kind of like chatbots, where if they're playing any games or interacting with um, anonymous chatbots online, it's sort of something similar, right? So it's just another electronic toy. I mean, I'm sure there are studies done based on like how iPad games are interactive, um, like online gaming, how, like changes or improves or, or, you know, decreases childhood development, but it's really just another like technology tool. Um, you know, we're, we still don't know how all of our appliances and our connected home is really going to work with each other. And I mean, this is just another thing to sort of add to that pot of the growing list of connected things. Um, and it just so happens that it's in the form of a cute little green dinosaur that your, your kids can play with. And one that happens to have the smartest computer in the world inside of it, which exactly. is admittedly <laughs> cool. Uh, so you also write about the smart Barbie. Is the smart Barbie this, the same kind of thing? Uh, sort of. It's another one of those things that talks back and remembers things, um, but it's just built with a different artificial intelligence software. Um, it's an actual toy company that has developed a number of iPad and mobile apps um, and so they're a pretty popular company already, and they're, all of their applications actually talk back to you. So this, this kind of like um, interactive adventure game thing where the kid can, you know, tap on the screen and talk to the, talk to the character. And as they go through this journey, um, the toys are talking back. So it's very similar. The Barbie doll, Mattel's partnered with this company, and the Barbie doll is called Hello Barbie. And Barbie remembers your child's name. Same thing, similar activities. Um, jokes, things like that. And it's not only this. I mean, we were at CES earlier this year and we saw a lot of these kinds of toys, right, where they're using, you know, machine learning or, or like different AI software and algorithms to really um, make sure that your, your kid is, is interacting and engaging with the toy. Um, and, I mean, it kind of goes both ways, right? Like, back in the day, we used our own imaginations to come up with these things and, and pretended that Barbie was talking to us. Um, but now our kids can actually, you know, engage with this toy and have the toy toy talk back. So it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of an expansion on that idea. Like we were, we always w wished our animals or our Barbie dolls would talk back to us. So it's kind of the next evolution of that. Right. Well, we just showed on the screen, Ian Thompson wrote in the register um, about the smart Barbie. He was a little more worried about the privacy aspects because mm -hmm. with her, the the, what you say goes back to the internet and goes up to the internet and then gets sent back. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know, are you all at all concerned with, uh, with the recording of your voice or your child's voice in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, that's another, another issue. Um, there was another connected doll that was actually, it was able to be hacked. Um, and again, you can pre, like reprogram the doll to say cuss words and, and to say certain things like that. And, and I mean, anytime we're on the internet, anytime we're, we're storing our data, same with the connected home, you always have to read the privacy policies. You always have to know what's going on with your data. Just like um, the recent uh, stuff about the Samsung smart TVs, you know, like making sure that you are taking control of your data. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, if you think that your child or um, or your nanny or your, yourself like might say something that you wouldn't necessarily want floating around in the cloud, then maybe don't get a talking Barbie doll. But again, you know, that's just another thing in the connected home in this whole, you know, this whole internet of things that we're really gonna have to pay attention to and really think about is getting our child this toy worth potentially like hackers, taking our data or having, you know, that's like a smart baby monitor that doesn't necessarily have all the protections in place. So again, it's just like weighing these questions. I mean, I'm sure like 10 years ago, we were not thinking like, would my child's Barbie doll be spying on me? Right. <laughs> it's a whole new frontier in the blood room. Well, I like your attitude. <laughs> really, it's a personal choice. No one's making anyone buy this Barbie doll. And, you know, you can have the risks. There's always risks with a Barbie doll, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially at when least, it talks to Right. You. At least she's smarter. Than she was. Uh, so let's move on to another one of your stories. Uh, you tested a product that uses virtual reality, specifically Oculus Rift, to simulate the mind of a schizophrenic. Tell us mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, so um, it was really interesting. There was this company called Visera. They're based uh, here in San Francisco, and uh, they make a lot of uh, products for healthcare, specifically a lot of VR video um, content for their clients. And this one in particular was for a pharmaceutical company that wanted to simulate uh, what it's like um, for schizophrenic patients with positive symptoms of schizophrenia, which is the one that we're usually um, more familiar with, which is, you know, disorienting thoughts, um, 
uh, hearing voices, things like that, um, very like more aggressive behaviors. Um, and so they decided to put together this video and they actually had their team members sort of act in this video of being like, I am, you know, I'm standing in this elevator and they were all staring at this person and talking. He thought that they were talking about him. And uh, yeah, this, so I see that this video that you were just showing was um, another simulation that, that is done from a first person perspective. And this is something that a lot of different companies have done. But what Vestira did was take this simulation and make it completely immersive. So you have the noise in your ears, it's coming from headphones, you see it all over. You can, and, and if you're watching it just on a video or something like on your computer, you can look away and you will leave the simulation. But when you're wearing the headset, it's really like, it's so real life. You're seeing the people staring at you and glaring at you. You're involved in this person's mind. And it goes on for about two minutes and it's supposed to simulate an experience that, that might make somebody uncomfortable. So it's in an, in an enclosed space in an elevator and people are just muttering. They, they first start whispering and then they start screaming and then all you want to do is like get out of this elevator. And it was really kind of like really mind blowing to me, you know? It was something that basically they created to help generate empathy for caregivers and doctors and people who might not know um, what this experience is like. And as I did mention in my post, however, it's impossible to fully simulate schizophrenia, of course, because there's this aspect of even if it's just you're just wearing it in an Oculus Rift, you know that it's a simulation. Whereas somebody who is has positive symptoms of schizophrenia, they don't know that it really isn't happening. Um, but it really shows the the potential for um, virtual reality in healthcare, specifically in mental health care, because this is a way for people to feel what people are feeling, at least on some level, and really get an immersive experience. And when I took the headset off, it sort of took me a minute to address myself back into the room, you know, because I, I had actually felt like I was in the elevator. I felt like these people were screaming at me. And um, because they had filmed their coworkers, it was very lifelike. So everybody in the video looked like a person because they were. They weren't, you know, 3D rendered um, versions of people. So it was really, it was really interesting. Wow. So uh, you have more empathy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a really interesting learning experience for sure. Oh, amazing. So last week, Facebook announced that they'd now allow you to designate a legacy contact to manage your page after you died. And that's prompted you to write about some other software that's helping us manage our digital, digital afterlives. What did you find out there? Yeah, so there's actually quite a few apps that are, are really kind of diving into this. And the, the Facebook legacy contact was really huge because um, a lot of people in the past have had issues or problems dealing with um, when a loved one or a friend dies and yet the like Facebook still keeps posting for them, posting on their, like, you know, they'll they'll get event invites or they'll, somebody will take over the account and like a photo or, you yeah, know. Yeah, you said that just... someone that your grandmother who had passed away liked one of your photos? Yes, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was kind of strange, you know. You see like my my dead grandmother likes X, you know, product or company, or I'll get a notification that says, you know, your grandmother liked your Facebook post. And, and I didn't know that somebody was managing her account. So it was kind of off-putting. Um, but when you designate that legacy contact, it can, it, like, you can say, you know, like, such and such person is going to be taking over this. You have that responsibility given to somebody else. And, um, and it, it sort of helps, you know, manage that transition of your digital data, like all of your personal information that was stored, somebody can, you know, that's passed on kind of like a will, right? Like somebody else can manage that information. So that was great for Facebook. I haven't des designated my legacy contact yet, but I'm sure I will soon. Um, and there are a couple other apps actually that sort of turn grieving into um, kind of almost like a virtual graveyard. So you can set up um, you can set up your tomb, right? Like Evertomb has this thing where you can set up your tomb. It's very similar. You put in all of your data. Um, you pay, they're, they're hoping to get people to pay a monthly fee of $1 to make sure all of their information stays there. And then after they die, it's kind of like this, you know, this tomb, I guess, but it's a digital version of it. Um, and then there's another one that's, that's using an, an application and it, they, you, like other people, when somebody dies, other people create um, a... Uh, like a, a tomb for you or a, like a place, a memorial, right? So it's called Rip Cemetery. And the idea is to be able to have this instead of like a cemetery where you would visit every day and leave flowers and notes and, and things like that. So you can still be connected to your loved one after they pass and other people 
um, that are in your family or your friend group can come to this application and, and leave notes and stuff like they would on a headstone. So it's sort of the next evolution. I mean, like where we talk about our lives online and, and how we're so immersed in, in all of this data and all of our information is, is everywhere online. So what happens like when you're gone, who manages that? How can you be remembered? And, um, I, and it, I just noticed this as a trend even before Facebook announced its legacy feature that this was happening. Um, and so there are a number of applications that are trying to get people to um, engage with their loved ones after death, but still in a social way. Well, thank you so much. You can uh, read more about uh, all of these topics that Selena wrote about at The Daily Dot. And you, you write new content all the time. So <laughs> check it out. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, take care. You too. Coming up, government and non-government hackers, and we celebrate Photoshop's birthday with the best hoaxes ever. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. February is almost over. What are you waiting for? Invest in yourself and learn something new with a free 10-day trial to lynda.com. Lynda.com is used by millions of people around the world and has over 4,500 courses on topics like web development, photography, visual design, and business, as well as software training like Excel, WordPress, and Photoshop. Are you looking to sharpen your coding skills or design the next great app? I recommend Lynda.com courses like Programming with iOS, Simple Android Development Tools, and Code Clinic, an innovative series where each month, Lynda.com issues a code challenge and authors share their solutions using different programming languages. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, each course is structured so you can learn at your own pace from start to finish. And of course, all Lynda.com courses are taught by experts who are accomplished professionals at the top of their field. Do something good for yourself and sign up for a free 10-day trial to Lynda.com by visiting Lynda.com slash TN2. You'll get unlimited access to every course including access on your iOS and Android devices, plus new courses as they're added each week. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2 to try it free for 10 days. Go ahead, learn something new. The website Grail Watch, always watching for Holy Grail timepieces, has run the numbers and decided that the Apple Watch Gold Edition will have to cost, wait for it, $10,000. They base this on the figure, they base this figure on the current cost of gold, the dimensions of a watch and how much gold they require, and the price of similar luxury watches. <sighs> can it just be April already so we can stop with the conjecture? At this point, I'm more interested in the watch that Steve Wozniak showed off on the BBC. It's made with old vacuum tubes, and it turns on when he turns his wrist, and the battery life lasts a minute. Here's an update on the story of the financial advisor Galen Marsh, who was fired from Morgan Stanley last month when information from 1,200 clients' accounts appeared for sale on Twitter, FileDropper, and other sites. There was no doubt that Marsh downloaded the client information and took it home with him, but he claimed that he didn't put that information online. Today, the Wall Street Journal reports that the focus of the investigation has now switched to hackers who might have accessed the information either from Galen Marsh or Morgan Stanley. In other hacker news, today NSA Director Michael Rogers said that after a thorough investigation, they believe that North Korea was behind the Sony hack. And in government hacker news, Edward Snowden has provided documents to The Intercept that support his claim that British and American spies hacked into the internal networks of Jamalto, the largest SIM card manufacturer in the world, Snowden alleges that the NSA and the GCHQ hacked the encryption keys that keep most of the world's cell phone conversations secure. In other words, your cell phone conversations are not private. They just aren't. <sighs> Photoshop turns 25 today. The product was released February 19th, 1990, at a time when we were still taking pictures on film. Do you remember that? I do. To honor the software, CNET today posted a list of the greatest hoaxes perpetrated by Photoshop. And here are just a few of my favorites. Several of them involve sharks. Not real. Photoshopped. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. If you've got news for us or tips or suggestions or you just want to say hi, write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. 
and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Mar Maroney. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.